you Jump, 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 jump What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party This is what we done started one, two, three, and the place to be is the BKMC, the MCEO, Talib Kweli. We are live from the home of hip hop. This is where hip hop started. We in the Boogie Down Bronx, where the people are fresh. We are at 1520 Sedgwick Avenue. This is officially where hip hop has started because the OGs were there and they have declared it so. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not gonna waste no time because a lot of spectacular activities happening right now, but we got a legend in the building. This man was a member of the legendary Cold Crush Brothers. This man works with the Kennedy Center Hip Pop Council. He is the CEO of GMC Entertainment. He is considered on everybody's list one of the greatest MCs of all time. The top MCs consider him a top MC. He's also in the DJ Techniques DJ Hall of Fame because he does every single part of hip hop. The, the b-boying, the graffiti, all of it, the style, all of it. Permanent fixture of Grand Concourse. This man has gotten praise from Rakim, Nas, Big Daddy Kane, Jay-Z famously shouted out his group. We're going to talk about that. A lot of music, a lot of records. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Casanova Fly, Grandmaster Kaz, and the place to be. What's up, OG? Love is love. Love, love is, is love. love. Love is love. Wow, the check is in the mail no, that for that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> you need to bring me on, on the road with you. Oh, for sure. I could do the whole James Brown okay. thing. I could, I could put the... I got the cape, too. I got so. the cape. I could put the cape on you and everything. How you feeling, bro? I'm good. I'm good. I feel great. Thank you for doing anniversary. this. I mean on the block where the first documented, and I got to say documented, hip hop right. party was given. This is sacred ground. That's you know right. I mean? We right here on the block. The music is playing. We have Biggie playing in the background. We have Biggie playing over that Juicy, but y'all was playing that in Sume back in the day. Yeah, no um, doubt. You was at this, these parties that Herc was throwing out here. I wasn't at the first party. Okay. Uh, I mean, a lot of people claim to have been. I never do. Um, mm -hmm. I lived like in walking distance from mm -hmm. 1520 Sedgwick Avenue. So mm -hmm. I caught the energy. Right. You know what I mean? From the older kids that were coming from Cool Herc parties. Right. I mean, like, yo, we going to Cool Herc party. I'm like, I'm a shorty. Right. You know what I mean? But, you know, I caught the bug and then I tried to emulate it without even seeing it. Yeah. You know, just by knowing, you know what I mean? And then the block parties, they were like, okay. And just start collecting records. And, and you know, I had already did the graffiti thing and start dancing. And I was just entranced into the culture, man. Yeah, you know right. from day one, like I said, I was close enough to smell it. Right. Okay, when the first party was given. I feel like as a participant in hip hop, what makes hip hop unique is that you can't just be a consumer of hip hop and say that you're a part of it. Like you could buy the records, but if you're gonna say that you hip hop, you gotta actually participate in some one of the elements of the culture. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah, they, they like to include like documentarians and mm. photographers and you know what I mean? That's like the third tier of, mm -hmm. of hip hop. The the, the ground the grassroots, the foundation lie in the mm -hmm. elements. Yes. And the artists who perform those elements and you know have a skill set within those elements. All yeah. right, the DJ, the, the B boy, yeah. the you know what I mean, the MC and the writer and the graph artist. I feel like the skill set is the great equalizer. This is what makes hip hop so beautiful. And that's what separates you from, you know what I mean? Right, like, it doesn't matter hey, where you come from. You, you you took a picture of this, I do this. Right. I mean, you wrote about this, I, I do, do this. this. You researched this, I do this. Right, or you bought and paid to consume it, this. Right, right, but or I you do have this. a corporate I live this. entity that you know promotes or puts on, right. but I do this. Right as evidenced by you doing it. And you're not just here because it's this celebration. You had, I mean, you came to my Blue Nose show. I see you in the underground spots. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Cold Crush because it's so important what y'all did for the culture, what y'all continue to do, um, waving that flag. Um, shout out to Tony Tone. Am I correct to say that he's the founder of the group or one yes. of the founders? Yes. Okay, yes, indeed. Um, what was your initial goals of forming Cold Crush? I, I didn't, I wasn't there at the inception of the formation of Cold Crush. I had my own crew from the inception of hip hop ever since I Is got involved. Mighty, Mighty Force? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, I mean, I went through so many okay. changes. A lot and, of you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was me. Okay. And then it was uh, me and Disco Wiz, Casanova mm -hmm. Fly and Disco Wiz. All right. And then it was the Mighty Force. And then it was the Force Five, Force Four. And then it was the Force Five. Mm -hmm. And then it was the Notorious Two. Okay. okay, with just me and JDL, and then we joined the Cold Crush Brothers. No doubt. So it was like a roller coaster ride, you know what right, I mean? Right, right, right. Searching for 
you know what I mean? The, what would stick? The right elements, the right, right the right people, the yeah. right you know situation, and and that landed with the Cold Crush brother. Disco Wiz, um, this is one of the first Latino DJs in hip hop culture. Yeah, uh, right? he's Puerto Rican and Cuban, yeah. and he was my DJ partner, my best friend. So you know, I put him. Like, yo, I'm doing this. Because he was a boxer. Okay. He used to box in okay. KL. You know what I mean? And he used to hear Cool Herp. Right. Like, setting up his sound system upstairs in the gym in the PAL and, and the music. And that's how he got hooked into the right. music. When we met, I'm like, yo, I do that. You know what I mean? Right. He got down with me and boom. You know what I mean? We I heard that. Uh, I heard. I saw an interview where Tony Tone was talking about how he fell back and let Charlie Chase become the, the, the front and center DJ of Cold Crush because he wanted to represent for Latinos. Tony Tone was more... Of like a like a DJ AJ, mm -hmm. AJ was more of a promoter than he was a DJ. Mm -hmm. Okay, he learned how to DJ mm -hmm. uh, just to do his own parties. Okay, right. but he was more of a promoter. Right. Um, and um, Tony was like that. Tony was a sound man. Mm -hmm. Tony was with the Brothers Disco, mm -hmm. DJ Breakout, and the Funky Four. You know, mm -hmm. early on, and when he left and decided to start his own group. It was on the basis of Charlie Chase, mm -hmm. highlighting Charlie Chase, being a Puerto Rican DJ who, who could cut and scratch and mm -hmm. played hip hop music. Right. Now, I bring this up because, um, you know, I'm African-American. I got African-American roots. My family is foundational to this place. I feel like in America, particularly in the Bronx and with all the social situations were happening, it created this unique stew where you had all these different people from these different cultures come and form hip hop together. But it could not have happened any place but right here in the foundation. But I know that I saw you speaking out because your name got dragged into this conversation that is largely online about people trying to separate black and Latino communities as far as the start of hip hop. Yeah, I mean, everybody wants credit for, for, for their contributions. <laughs> right. You know, and there's nothing went wrong, but people try to, you know, draw too many definitive lines between what's what and what's what, mm -hmm. all right? In, in the 70s, in the Bronx, it was a melting pot. Right. Okay. Like you just explained that you're African American, your roots is African American, but you could be Caribbean, yeah. Haitian, you yeah. know, anything I'm, like I'm that. From we didn't I'm from Brooklyn. I'm from Brooklyn. I'm officially, officially Caribbean because I'm from Brooklyn. Okay. On oh, oh, that side, <laughs> right. Okay. But I mean, as far as ethnicity is concerned, yeah. we wasn't involved with that on a level where, okay, I'm, I'm Honduran and mm -hmm. I'm doing hip hop or I'm, if, if you were dark skinned, you was black. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And Puerto Ricans had their own culture, their own language, their own this and this and that. Mm -hmm. But we lived together. Right. So at some point, we're going to intermingle. Mm -hmm. All right? We're in a park. We share the park. We're on the court. We're in a basketball court. They're in a handball court. Yeah. All right? We play yeah. a turntable. They're playing congas. They yeah. Miles. At yeah. some point, that's going to intersect. Yes. Yes, You indeed. know? And one culture is going to get interested in that one, and this one going to get interested in the other. I think the Latino uh, culture got interested in hip-hop early and, be, and and became a part of it. Yes, okay? indeed. Yes, indeed. Now, I want to just thank you again for Cold Crush because I feel like battling has evolved in a lot of ways. But for my money, the era of Cold Crush versus Fantastic Five, to me, this is the essence of the hip-hop battle. You know, because it's like, when you go back and listen to some of them tapes, I wasn't outside back then. But you could feel that, you could almost smell the energy in the room. The way the girls are shouting, the thing, the, like it felt serious. Yeah. Even when they try to recreate it in wild style, they even with the acting, it's yo, yo, I told you. You can tell like, it was serious. Something, something underneath you that, know? right? Yeah. So, can you break down from your your perspective the evolution of battling from then to what you have now, where you got the Smack DVD and you got the Caffeine Leagues and all this? Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, the origin of a battle, and this goes back to the fifties. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When the doo-wop singers used to ba have battle of the bands mm -hmm. and, and like the same thing. But for us, a battle was a test of skill against each other. You you go up there and you rhyme. Right. Now, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to rhyme. Right. And then the people are going to decide who the rhymed people. the best. It's proletarian. Okay? It's about the people. If it's a group, yeah. we're going to get up there. We're going to do our thing. Y'all going to get up there and do that. And the people are going to say, all right, this is who we think is best or who we thought is best. That's the, early, the, the tradition of battling. Yeah. When Kumo D snuck Busy B <laughs> in Harlem World right. and assaulted him, verbally assaulted him. Uh -huh. Okay, this wasn't just I say a rhyme, you say a rhyme. Mm -hmm. I'm attacking you. 
your persona. I'm saying shit about you and all that. Mm -hmm. That changed the dynamic of battling. Yeah, it made yeah, it personal. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, I think that's what's going on today. The Smack DVD and the, right. you know, the battle rap rapping is cool, but they've adapted that kind of aggressive, violent, like fuck you and your family kind of right. thing. That like like that. Nah, nah. You rhyme, he rhyme, mm -hmm. and see who best. Niggas ain't even rhyming no more. They just talking shit against each other. Right. You know what I mean? So the right. art of the battle is intact that the competitive edge of going against another man to see who's best okay but the parameters that you judge that by have changed drastically yeah i was at yankee stadium last night and um krs came out with fat joe yankee stadium in the bronx and he put some extra emphasis on some of them lyrics yeah from bridges over in south bronx because he's representing that battle culture where he's from exactly but it was also good to see that Nas threw it, but KRS could do that. Nas is a child of hearing KRS diss Queens, right, bitch, right, and he and, had to come up and live under that. And Ma and uh, 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 Marley and um, Shan <laughs> was that. performed yep. as well last That's right. night. And so. I love the KRS album, Marley, but I love that Nas came out and he put some extra emphasis when he said Queens get the money, and then he was able to bring out Run DMC. Right. So it was like a, a good uh, balance. Like it was good to see us of age representing the culture no doubt no doubt and it's good for queens to have um closure right and um that was closure That's and, what that and, was. and respect put yeah. on, on on their contribution to hip-hop because like now we could say something right all right maybe right. then nigga yeah but now yeah. <laughs> what now the bronx is <laughs> the fire under the ass because a lot no of doubt. great music came out of queens immediately following that when, whenever you're first whenever you set the trend whenever you laid a blueprint Everybody else's job is to improve on that blueprint. That's right. That's right. Now, let's talk a little bit about Rapper's Delight. Rapper's Delight, for a lot of people, including me, was the first time you hear hip-hop in the mainstream space. You famously wrote these lyrics for Rapper's Delight, but for years were not credited. As a matter of fact, I feel like the people who know that you wrote uh, Big Bang Hank's verse are people just within the culture. I want to, to get your to feelings on that. To a large extent, yeah, yeah. You got to be hip-hop to know that story. I, I take for granted that everybody knows the story because I've been telling it, you know what I mean, for, for I don't know how long. I mean, the, people the, been asking the verse me starts about with it. spelling out your name. Yeah, So yeah. you're paying attention, it's obvious. I mean, the true, the true essence of it is I, I wrote those rhymes for myself. And when he copied it, he copied them word for word. Right. So instead of changing it and up. he was to, managing you or something at the time. Yeah, yeah. He was managing uh, me before I joined the Cold Crush Brothers. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how he got around me. That's how he, he learned the lyrics. Right. You know, he re uh, he borrowed money from his parents to get us a bigger sound system so we could still do jams like this out mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And uh, in order to pay it back, he had to get a job. Right. Because we wasn't making enough money at hip hop to pay back that loan. He right, got a right. job in the pizza shop in New Jersey. And, that's, and that's, where that's where, you know, Sylvia, you right. know, discovered him. So or whatever. And uh, he never said, I managed Casanova Fly. Right. He, he like, I'm Casanova Fly. Type shit. I've watched a couple of your interviews and um, I know there's been a long journey from dealing with feeling conflicted about that to gain a closure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've also heard you speak about those guys also got robbed from the label, too. Yeah, yeah. exactly. A long, for a long time. You know, you think, oh, yeah, they getting they getting this and that. These they going all over the world. They getting that. Niggas got this and that. But a lot of time you don't know the untold story. Look at Salt and Pepper. Not Salt and Pepper, but uh, TLC. Yeah. OK, they doing show worldwide shows, tours, this and that. You think they got it made. They was broke as hell. All right. So just speaking of wild style for a second, um, if you snap your fingers, will somebody throw you a basketball right now? <laughs> if they had one, probably. Um, we 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 right down the block from Cedar Park. Okay. I mean, where we play basketball. Um, yeah, hopefully somebody would. <laughs> yeah, that was a very um, it's a very choreographed scene. Um, I love oh, the way AD looking so. in the camera in the scene. <laughs> you know what? I know everybody noticed that, and I hate it. I hate the fact. And let it's me classic. tell you, before, it's classic. before we shot the scene, uh -huh. the last thing that he said. Nobody look into the camera. <laughs> AD was like. <laughs> and then like. No doubt, no doubt. Um, now, Cold Crush, when you listen to, and not just Cold Crush, but the Grandmaster Cast freestyle tapes, tapes that were making the rounds, you listen to these routines. These routines are the foundation of so many hip hop songs, so many hip hop routines, like 
Like you not doing hip hop unless you emulating what y'all was doing. You know what I'm saying? At a point. Yeah. At a point. And then it trickles down because even though people aren't doing that traditionally anymore, mm -hmm. the the kickback from it is alive. So you get you got part of it. You doing something related to that at some point, yeah. whether you know it or not. You you you. It's in the it's in the music. They sampling the songs. Me myself. You know what I'm saying? Like I got songs. I got countless songs over my career, 17 albums, where I'm taking all types of phrases and I don't even realize I did it. And so I go back and listen, oh, oh that's where I got that from. Okay. But it's just in my DNA. Got you. That's just got part you. of hip hop. Exactly. You know what exactly. I'm saying? Exactly. So um, let's talk about the 77 Blackout. Because for a lot of people, that was the first time you saw a lot of DJs get their hand on equipment that was previously unavailable. Definitely. And I've spoken on that in, in many interviews, but you know how. You know, people take something and run with it way past where they should have ran. Yeah. I mean, they it wound up looking like hip hop grew because of the blackout. I would say that. Equipment was available to people yeah. who, who would have had to, you know, never been able to go into a store yeah. and pay for that at yeah. the time. You know what I mean? And that's not like everybody turned into DJs. Whoever right. was interested in that got a fortification of equipment through the streets because of the blackout. But they blew it out of proportion. I mean, I personally went and, and, and broke in a spot <laughs> and got a mixer. Okay? I'm already a DJ, so right. that's the shit I'm interested in. Right. They broke into everything. Check cashing places, um, jewelry stores, uh, bodegas and shit. They were selling cigarettes, everything from cigarettes to bicycles the next day after the blackout. So it wasn't just equipment that, you know, that, that got, you know, spread out, you know what I mean? It was everything that was available out here. Yeah, I was born in 75, so I was two years old when that happened. I was 17, in the park, DJing when the lights went out. Mm. That's crazy. Thanks. That's crazy. I want to talk a little bit about how the style evolved from, which is more like a toasting style, where you just bigging up the DJ as an MC, to how it goes from that to becoming more rhyming. Good question. No doubt. Good question. Not a lot of it. I ain't take I'm an a, MC. Takes an MC to yeah. ask a question like that. Um, it went from kind of toasting, uh, just like kind of talking over the mic, to rhythms when people start attaching uh, little, like, i give you an example. Mm -hmm. There was a Great Bear commercial, and, 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 it, and it used to go, you're driving down the highway in the dead of the night, and up ahead, there's a terrible sight. So you hit the brakes. They're not all there. You miss this one by only a hair. You drive a little further, you say a little prayer, won't happen again till you get the great bear. Now, this is a fucking TV commercial. Right. Before rap. Right. Was it, it, was it rap. called rap? It wasn't called rap. It wasn't called rap. It, just, it was just, that's at the, the time culture. when people were toasted. Yeah. You know, and just like a Coke LaRock, who, who is the, we, right. we call the first MC. Coke the Rock is from the tradition of Gil Scott Heron. Right. You know what I mean? And the last, last poet. Poets, like he get up there and talk that era. hustler shit. Yeah, that's like, like the Coon again. Party people in the house. You yeah. listen to the this and that. Like that. It evolved from that, from people incorporating um, little phrases from TV commercials, like television uh, program, Gilligan's Island. People start making little melodies off of that until fully blown routine. We took that aspect to the 10th power. Yes, indeed. Y'all singing I Dream of Genie routines. Uh, we doing Gilbert O'Sullivan. That's right. Okay. That's right. Y'all doing Gilligan's Island. All right. We doing Barry Manilow. We right. doing Three Dog Night routines. Uh, Y'all niggas don't even know where this shit is coming from. But put that shit over love rap. And what's crazy about what you just said is that in order for you to be fully hip hop, what the beautiful thing about it is, you have to be knowledgeable about all music. All music All because music. Hip, there no was the no hip-hop music. Right. Okay, we took music from everything that was out there. We never had a beat in it. Because the beat, the break, is the break, foundation the of hip-hop music. You're listening to one of the most classic hip-hop anthems right. right now. That's right. Okay, and it's about to break down to the break right now. Right now. That's okay. a DJ talk right People there. People live for this part of this song. That's right. Uh, break that down about how sacred the break was. The break was everything. The break created hip hop. Okay, hip hop was just another party until the breaks became the exclusivity in the party. And we can thank Kool yeah. Herc for that. Okay? Kool Herc played the whole record, but when the break came, he kept playing breaks 
from then on. They right. called it the merry-go-round. And this is this was the meat of the party. This is what yeah, they played some disco records. In yeah. In the beginning. But when the party starts, when them fucking break beats come on, mm. that's when everybody make the circle, the right. B-boys coming, you know what I right. mean? And that's the foundation of our music. That's why they call it break dancing. No doubt. Because we dance to the breaks no doubt. of the of the of the song. Now, to harp on what you said earlier about there's a lot of people who claim to be in the culture, but they just they they just kind of outside of the culture. When the culture started becoming more corporate and com commercialized, you start seeing movies, start seeing TV shows, you know, graffiti rock, flash dance. People start getting deals, endorsements. Right. Cold Crush and you kind of stayed away from that. Am I correct to say that? We didn't stay away. We would we got we were outside of it. You know, that was after us. That was like the next generation, okay. pretty much. We never had a commercially successful record mm -hmm. to kind of push us into the next right, generation. Okay. So we basically, we were like the best live group, the last dope live group right. of the first generation of hip-hop. But those radio artists had to open for y'all. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. But once, once it became necessary to have a hit record, mm -hmm. that's when the, like, the first thing, the first, uh, uh, right. if you didn't have one, you kind of faded back toward the right. background. And the next generation came out, the Run DFCs, the LL Cool J's, the Houdini's, the Curtis Blo Now the parameters have changed. And this is where Jay-Z says, I'm overcharging niggas for what they did to the Cold Crush. One of the greatest MCs of all time, but also a very corporate artist, very commercial artist. Um, has he ever broke y'all off for that lyric? Nah, Jay-Z never um, called, sent out a kite or <laughs> nothing like that. To me, it was just a clever line. Mm -hmm. You know, Jay-Z is clever, and he's known for using other people as references and, mm -hmm. and this and that. So to me, people are like, what do you think? Of, you know, I'm like, I think it was a clever line, mm -hmm. you know? And, and in essence, he said, I'm overcharging, you know, corporate America for what they did to the Cold Crush, mm -hmm. all right? So in other words, I'm robbing from the rich in the name of the poor. <laughs> yeah. I'm not robbing right, from the right, rich right. to I get give it. to the poor, right. but I'm robbing from the rich right. in the name of the poor. Right. That's what I took from it. <laughs> so yeah, no, we haven't been broken off or nothing. I didn't expect no to be broken off or uh, anything. Uh, but maybe, you know, like, explain to people who, what, who the Cold Crush are right. and what they did. Because right. I don't know, and why I don't, to that? this day, I don't know why what they did to the Cold Crush, but I know they did something, and I know you know it now. That's powerful, that's powerful. Yeah. Now, last time I hung out with you, I got to meet Melly Mel for the first time. Melly Mel's an icon of this culture. No doubt. He's a foundational to this no culture. Doubt. Um, you know, again, I wasn't outside when Melly Mel was outside doing his thing, but it cannot be denied that he's a blueprint. He's recently gotten back and forth with Eminem. Yeah. I know that's a good friend of yours. I know that's not particularly your issue, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity if you had any thoughts about the Melly Mel Eminem situation. Here's what I think about it. And I usually try to stay away from mm -hmm. shit like that, especially people feel like I'm the one who should comment the most about something. But I'm not one of them niggas that jump on every controversy and I put my two cents in. Right. My opinion is valuable and I keep it to myself for that's the most right. part. With great power comes great responsibility. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but this being my brother, I just want to say, that he has every right to state his opinion as anybody else does. And uh, when other people state uh, opinions that aren't popular, you know, they, are, they aren't ostracized for it the way he was for stating something that he thought. Him being one of the greatest MCs of all time, okay, gives him the right. And not even that, just as a man, just as a person, he had a right to, exp to say whatever he wanted to say. Yeah. Okay. Now, Eminem came back at him feeling like he had to, probably got pressure from his peers or whatever. And now Mel went back at him. It's hip-hop. That, that's hip-hop. Mm -hmm. That's, that's hip-hop. Hip now, you want to judge who who did better, who what? That's up to each individual because the shit is all up to what the person thinks. Yeah. I've seen reviews, positive reviews. I've seen negative reviews. And, and, and that's hip-hop. So as long as it stay hip-hop, yeah. ain't nobody shooting nobody. Ain't nobody can't come to that other person's town or nothing yeah. like that. Or when we see each other, we gonna have, then it's hip hop. It's hip hop. And in the name of hip hop, I just want to share my opinion on the matter because I have a great amount of respect for Melly Mel and I got a great amount of respect for Eminem. Eminem has always 
in my opinion, and I think he should do this as a white MC, as always going above and beyond to show respect for the OGs with the t-shirts and this and that. So I was surprised that he, he didn't let the OG uh, Melly say, say what he wanted to say because he didn't diss Eminem personally. No, he, he didn't. He stated in a, a subjective artistic opinion. Which we should be able to take from our from our elder from our OG. Exactly. You know what I'm exactly. And uh, consider the source. And yeah, right? and if somebody yeah. else would have said that shit, and they'd have been way out of line or right, right, depending right. on how but this is Melly Mel and he said it right. in an articulate, you know, you know, way. And that should be that. Yes. You know what I mean? But me, personally, if I say something about somebody, nigga, eat it or holla at me. Right. Eat it or holla at me. Don't go out in the, in the you know what I mean, and this and this and that. You know what I mean, and try to, you know, cause no, because that's what that's what the East West shit happened. That's exactly you know right. I mean? Then you start getting a lot of people that ain't even involved in it. It becomes more than it actually is. That's right. Instead of two brothers, all right, bound by this microphone. Yo, let's let's sit down. Let's let's you know, and it ain't gotta be public. Yeah. Yo, you know what? Let's 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 sit down. Meet me somewhere. Yes, indeed. Let's sit, uh, no cameras. Let's yes, let's indeed. sit down. I'm with all that. Well, OG, you've given us a lot of your time. Your time is very valuable and precious. You are one of the reasons why everybody's gathered here. I want you to know that. We love you. We appreciate you. We respect the hell out of you. And we are honored to have you on People's Party. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, man. I'm honored to be here. Grandmaster Cash, y'all. Happy 50th anniversary, hip-hop. No doubt. Thank you, OG. Appreciate you. All right.